though there were parts of that video that um, the sound was a little low. If you can't hear something, remember, uh, you can also click on the video, play it yourself, and just go to the part that was hard to hear. Especially when that guy right there talks. Uh, his voice isn't as loud as the narrator, so you can always play it back. But let's go on to video number three, oyster farmers facing uh, climate change. And on your notes, that's video number three here, so we can see how they are different and what different information you get from each source. to go down with my mom and pack oysters right off the table with her. When I was a kid, they put a little stool up there and I'd get my own little set of gloves and I'd get to sort and pack oysters. And to me, it was like the most fun thing to do ever. <laughs> That's the scary part. It's happening faster than scientists predicted. Because they knew it was happening. Once they saw the evidence. There's lots of small generational businesses that have um, lived off of the oyster industry here in Wolf Bay for generations and generations. It's really deep in the history. And then the type of people that live here. We're oyster and clam farmers, and that's about it. That's all we do here. That's the environment yeah. that we have. Something happened in 2008 that we didn't quite understand, and that was hatcheries that normally would start in spring. Uh, noticed the larvae dying in their tanks. Huge mortalities. And we weren't, we weren't getting the seed we needed. Everyone was concerned as to, as to what was going on. What the oceanographers had told us, this was actually one of the effects of, of global warming. Uh, you're seeing a pH shift in the ocean. It's more evident off of our coast because of the upwelling that occurs during the summer months when the northwest wind blows. Yeah, the upwelling. Water from the bottom comes up. Uh, without oyster seed, the farm would slowly die. It's a three-year to market product. We could survive for a few more years, but not having that oyster seed would be just prolonging death of the business, more or less. Death of our farm. And my father, at that point, decided that there had been some studies that were going on and that this was going to be something that was going to keep on occurring. So we started a hatchery over in Hilo, Hawaii. It was a big gamble in starting a hatchery and branching out and going to a different locale, but I just felt that that's what, that's what made the most sense for me to do. So as you're taking your notes, you've got uh, the last video. The solution they did was monitor the pH and, and grow your, your larva, your oysters, when the pH is the highest, which means it's less acidic. In this video, the solution they're doing is very different. They're growing their oysters in Hawaii because their waters are less acidic. Remember, our waters are the most corrosive, the most acidic. So they had to ship their growing oysters all the way to Hawaii just to keep their business going. Uh, so two very different solutions. And uh, it's, it's not as effective as the big solution, which is stop burning fossil fuels, but it keeps them in business until we can fix the bigger problem. Oh boy. Do you guys like oysters? My wife does. I do not. The difference 
between us and like general society is that we see the impact that it has. We're probably uh, the first one that is raising our hand saying, it's here, it's real, we see this. So for us, we have to be very proactive and we have to watch it and we have to monitor it to make sure that our business doesn't get put in a predicament in the future where we won't be able to have a healthy farm. And this is why climate change is so sneaky. People can say, oh yeah, I don't believe it because look, I'm cold in the winter and I'm warm in the summer. I don't see any climate change. But in places like this, we see it. So there's another example of how climate change, the effects, are known in some places, but not in others. And that concludes this episode.